Hi, my name is Yuki Jackson. I am a poet, I'm an educator, and I'm also one of the judges for your upcoming Poetry Out Loud competition here in Florida. And I am super excited to be able to share in this event with all of you, um, especially in celebrating the love of poetry, which as we know, we need more than ever. Right. And, you know, how much we know poetry has the ability to really give voice to what can often be really difficult to make sense of in our world and in our lives. And so, you know, the fact that you are taking on uh, this endeavor, you know, to be able to convey it through your life is just amazing. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, so the purpose of this video today is I just wanted to share a brief overview and, you know, hopefully um, some things that might be helpful in preparing for uh, conveying your poem. And, you know, I'm still learning myself, you know, how to constantly improve myself, what I can apply uh, to be able to deliver my poetry to the best of my ability. And what I'm finding is that more than anything, it's really a combination of three things. Um, it's really in, you know, the unity between our mind, our body, and our spirit, you know, in conveying a piece of writing. So I'm going to share my screen and just show you some of the tips. And so going into it, bringing poetry to life through mind, body, and spirit. Um, so I know that Poetry Out Loud also has a lot of other useful resources and videos on their website. So definitely make sure to check that out as well. Um, and so for that reason, there's you know already a lot of great practical tips that y'all have at your fingertips. So I just kind of wanted to shed light um, on the same subject, just through a little bit of a different angle um, through this component, right, of the mind, body, and spirit, and the unity. So first is the mind. <laughs> and the mind part means basically doing a little bit of, you know, not homework, <laughs> as in, you know, like something you have to turn in, obviously. Um, but, you know, more as just doing a little bit of research, you know, just Google basically the poet uh, whose work you're going to cover. Um, this is really going to help you in terms of really immersing yourself in the mind and, you know, in the intention of that particular poet. And by doing that, you're going to be able to convey what they wrote on a different level, you know, and it's really going to just like drive it further home within yourself as well. And so, for example, um, one resource that is available is if you go to the Poetry Foundation website, uh, they have an extensive database of many poets, you know, both from the past, but also a lot of living poets. Um, so, for example, Danez Smith, who is a very powerful poet, um, you know, so as you can see, they have some of their background, you could read about their life, you know, you can delve into it even further. Um, they also have links to their other poems. And so I think that's also helpful to not only, you know, familiarize yourself with that one poem uh, or poems that you're going to be delivering, um, but also in studying their other work. Because by doing that, you're really going to get a more full sense of who this poet is, what their concerns are, you know, and how they tend to express themselves in their writing. And so as you do this process of just delving into the poet and the poem further, um, I also recommend that you keep these kind of key questions in mind, um, you know, just to help yourself out to connect more. Um, and so, you know, some of them include like, what do you think is the poet's motivation, right? So if it's a living poet or a poet in more of a modern times, there's a lot of times we have access to their interviews, um, whether through video or, you know, written in a publication. So I would definitely look into that. Um, so they may answer some of these questions themselves, but then sometimes with some poets, um, we may not have access to that information, right, of these specific questions. So in those cases, 
you know, you're going to have to try to do your best to maybe fill in some of the gaps, right, of just kind of based on what they tend to write about or, you know, how they wrote, um, you know, what do you think their motivation might have been, right? And some of the other questions um, that you may want to keep in mind as well as you uh, look into their background is, you know, what was their process? Um, you know, what about the content of that particular poem resonates with you? Um, and then another um, aspect that I think will really help you in terms of delivering the poem will also be really paying attention to the structure of the poem, right? So especially, you know, for poets who, you know, publish their work, um, you know, we're intending for the words and the way that we place them on the page to be read um, many times, um, not always, but many times, to be read in the way that they occur on the page. So a lot of times, well, you'll see a line break, you know, where one line's going into the next, or you'll see some spaces, um, you know, all of the placement of the words on the page and paying attention to it, that'll also help you in emphasizing certain parts of the poem, or leaving spaces, silence, a pause where it's also needed. So now going into the body part of mind, body, and spirit of bringing a poem to life um, or embodying your poem. I recently had the opportunity to attend um, a poetry uh, fellowship. You know, it was a series of workshops for poets of color um, from an organization called The Watering Hole. And it was incredible. Um, one of the workshops we had was facilitated by uh, this renowned spoken word poet named Ebony Stewart. And so Ebony gave a really comprehensive performance checklist uh, to really sort of guide um, you know, our preparation to embody the poem in a physical sense and in preparing. So some of these things include just really making sure you practice in different settings. Um, you know, so obviously the first place we're gonna come to is the poem on the page itself. So, you know, make sure that, you know, you're definitely familiar with that part. So reading it out loud to yourself, you may also wanna read it uh, to somebody else, um, you know, cause that's gonna also help uh, you to get more comfortable with uh, sharing it aloud. Um, and then another, you know, important part of being able to practice in the different settings physically is to be in an actual physical space where you're going to be delivering a poem if possible. Um, and then lastly is uh, being able to practice using the virtual setup, right? So if you're using video or the equipment with the mic or the lighting, whatever it is, you know, make sure you run through that and practice with it, uh, you know, before uh, you're ready to go. Some other things on the performance checklist are, you know, being able to um, just kind of really train yourself to be able to focus <laughs> in the moment. Um, it can be challenging, right, especially in most settings, um, especially in public, you know, where uh, you may have to be able to go against the noise of what's happening around you, you know, so that is one type of uh, concentration to really try to hone in on in this process as you prepare. Um, another tip that she shared, which I hadn't really thought about myself before, was, you know, <laughs> she was encouraging that, you know, even if, you know, you wanna get your outfit, um, you know, your brand new clothes for this performance and you're excited about it and that's great, but make sure that you at least wear those clothes once before at least um, for a little while. Um, you know, just so you have a sense of how they feel on your body so that in that moment, you're not wearing clothes that you've never worn and then feel uncomfortable and you're, you know, just kind of like focusing more on your clothes, you know, more than you are on the poem and being able to deliver it, right? Um, and so another tip is to perform through the mess ups. <laughs> so I think that's also, it's just sort of like a profound um, and vital life skill as well, right? Just like be able to like, even if you slip up, you mess up, you're like, oh no, but you know, just don't dwell on the mess up and just power through that, you know, and continue, um, you know, cause most times, maybe nine times out of 10, you know, as long as you yourself don't 
dwell on the mess up and you just keep going, either the audience first may not even notice it, or even if they did notice it, they're going to quickly forget it, right? Because you're, you're not uh, sitting with it, you know, and you're continuing to still, um, you know, do the rest of your poem to the best of your ability. Um, and then um, another important point is that, you know, in order to uh, be, you know, delivering the passion or the intensity um, in many of these poems, you don't necessarily have to be loud, right? So there's still a way that you can project your voice in a clear way, but without it having to be overly dramatic and shouting. So just something to you know try to be conscious of. Um, and so I want to share with you this example. This is um, someone I know, but I also am a fan of. Um, he is a really, really uh, powerful spoken word poet named Dennis Amadeus. He's from Tampa Bay, um, and, but he's traveled the country, um, you know, performing his work. And you know, you'll really kind of notice his delivery. Um, and that's why I'm using as him as an example um, is because he's so natural, you know, when he is sharing his words. And so, you know, even though there are, you know, kind of heightened emphasis that he's placing in certain areas through the way he expresses himself overall, it kind of just sounds like he's having a conversation with you, you know. And so as you watch, um, it's just a few minutes, um, but, you know, just kind of keep an eye out for, you know, the way he's pacing himself through the poem. Um, also, um, take note of the way he projects his voice without shouting, um, and also the kind of body language that he uses, right, where he is definitely using um, his face and his arms, especially, to express himself, you know, but again, without being overly dramatic. Snap back hat, starter windbreaker jacket, black jeans with holes in them. I wore poverty like a fashion thing. Long before it was cool to wear hats with bent brims or really tight t-shirts or jeans with holes in them. And then suddenly somebody took notice and now my childhood struggles are worn ironic by people who don't even know why it's ironic to begin with. Does that count as hipster? Is this cultural appropriation? Is poverty a culture now? Seems to be a lot cooler than it was in my day when you had to keep the sticker on your fitted cap to prove just how fresh you were. I never knew my fitted size, but at the time, snapbacks were much cheaper, but were blasphemy at the lunch table churches of high school. Condemned me to burns that damned my confidence. One of the biggest lessons I learned in this world is value the things you can't afford. Three years ago, I moved into a house that I could afford with four battleship roommates, all harboring a passion for changing the world around them. Thus, a concrete road was grown in a Seminole Heights neighborhood in Tampa, Florida, where everybody was always outside. The smell of barbecue crept over the fence like a nosy neighbor, the sound of trash talk, accented curbside conversations. I used to just sit on my porch and watch a live canvas, swirling with the colors of loudness, struggle and resilience, love, splattered down a frame of broken homes, but streets wore poverty like a fashion statement. Long before it was cool to blast rap music at 10 a.m. Saturday morning coffee shops, or wear skinny jeans with holes in them, or rock cornrows in Vogue magazine. And then suddenly somebody took notice. And in just two years, I've sat on this porch and watched the stronghold of 15 be washed away. Watch buildings once claimed by trees be reclaimed by banks. Watch people build up stores that do something good in the neighborhood. They've never felt any of the bad. A neighborhood they only felt safe enough to enter after the police left. After native residents were moved out either in bags or in handcuffs, I didn't know you needed a drug dog to find a serial killer. A murderer who was a stain on this colorful canvas so bleach was poured over the whole neighborhood, then deemed seminal strong. How bold to name something after the people you killed to get it. Bold like a hunter's trophy room. Bold like the victims of a serial killer's names brushed onto a wall only to be taken down right before election season. Just like the people that used to live here, forgotten, 
just like the families that actually lost those loved ones. As the trendy blood of appropriation continues to pump through a micro groove heart, bleeding a culture dry that it was too colorblind to recognize in the first place, I tried to ignore the remodelers painting the town white in front of my eyes like I did the kids making fun of my sketches or the jeans I wore every day for a week. But now I sit on my porch and watch a neighborhood once filled with people who shared that same struggle turn into a neighborhood of people who choose to dress like that, who chose this place to live. And I hate that the worst part of it all is that I'm jealous. To see a community come together over the capture of a serial killer, but never over the suffering of its residents. And I miss the liveliness of a Friday night store session. I miss the laughter bellowing over the fence. I miss my friends in this humble corner of Tampa before it was a trend. You kick out the ones living there in the first place. Hipster pilgrims turned founding fathers. Turn this is all's land into this land is our land. Turn the natives into a symbol of strength. Stamp that symbol onto snapbacks and windbreakers and jeans with the holes in them to be sold and seminal heights. Seminal, strong. So again, you know, you just kind of notice how the way that he presented himself and his body um, and his voice, um, you know, was all true to the poem itself. Um, you know, the personality of the poem, you know, he wasn't really uh, going against that. So, you know, the same way that we can deliver a poem um, is through really knowing our own style you know, and, you know, having whatever we share be what matches the poem, right? Um, and so, you know, it's also really challenging, or it can be challenging to also be present and honest, um, you know, especially when we may be performing, um, you know, words that we didn't, uh, you know, necessarily uh, write ourselves but there's just really something that can come through you, right? Um, when you are present in that poem itself and connecting to the meaning behind it. And so, uh, you know, a couple strategies to kind of just help to, you know, get us to the place where we can be that present um, to where we're allowing the poem and the words and the meaning to inhabit us um, is, you know, some self-care. Right. And so you could do some self care um, actions beforehand and then preparation, you know, but also make sure to do it afterward, right, to take care of yourself. So some of the self care that you could do um, leading up to your performance, um, and even some of this you could do like the day of or, you know, right before, um, for example, is like some deep breathing, some meditation. Um, you know, doing some kind of activity that you enjoy or a hobby, maybe something to just kind of like take your mind off of the performance, you know, just to give your brain a minute to breathe and relax. And then that way, when you present, you will come with it in a more comfortable uh, way. Um, you know, some people also want to take a walk, do some physical exercise just to get some of the nervous energy out of your body as well. Or the converse to also like try to get some energy flowing if you're kind of feeling low key um, at that moment. Um, you know, so just overall, just, you know, doing different things, whatever it is for you, that just helps to really refresh your spirit. So this last part, um, speaking of spirit, <laughs> Uh, is, uh, you know, really, again, you know, I know I've kind of like already mentioned before, but just really want to emphasize and leave on the note that at the end of the day, you know, after like all of your preparation and, you know, familiarizing yourself and embodying the poem and practicing, you know, the most important part is to really connect for you yourself to connect to the heart and the spirit that is behind the word. Right. And, you know, just really allowing yourself to be almost like a vessel <laughs> through which the poem is being delivered. Right. Kind of like how life is itself, you know, like a child even, you know, so, you know, letting that poem sit in you and then bring it to other people. Right. Because, you know, you connect with it again. There can be something that connects. Uh, you know, with somebody else and may enliven their lives or, you know, and it just is also an exercise in really deepening your own uh, connection 
right, to the poem and, you know, everything it stands for. Um, so one way to really, you know, strengthen this connection process um, within yourself is to really focus on why it is that you connect to the poem. Why did you pick the poem? You know, what about it really resonates with you? Um, you know, so just some examples of some reasons um, that a poem might connect to a person might be, you know, because that poem helps you feel less alone, or maybe it talks about some kind of a social justice issue that you're super passionate about. Maybe it tells a narrative that, you know, really resonates with you or you haven't heard before and it speaks to you. Um, you know, whatever it is, right? Um, so it could be one of these reasons or it can be a completely different reason, but whatever is the case, you know, just uh, really recommend that you meditate, <laughs> um, you know, and just really hone in on the why, you know, um, this kind of reminds me of one of my favorite quotes um, is by this dancer and choreographer named um, Deshaun and uh, this was on an episode of a show called My House, uh, which documents uh, the ballroom scene and voguing. And, you know, he's telling a group of dancers who are preparing for a performance. He says, you know, you know, people, a lot of people know how, right? But not everybody knows why. So I want you to focus on the why, you know, because that's what's going to come through your body. That's what people are going to feel. You know, and so I was just felt like that, you know, mindset um, is just so relevant, you know, to anything that we take on, um, but especially in being able to convey, um, you know, words that came from such a, you know, intimate place within a person, um, you know, and that they're using in order to communicate you know, some ideas um, and, you know, hopefully be able to illuminate others, right? So these are some of the things, again, you know, just uh, to share some things that are helping me that I'm learning from, continuing to learn from as a poet. And so um, hopefully um, at least one of, uh, you know, the things that I shared may be helpful to you. And um, so looking forward to seeing all of you. And I hope to be able to see you in person also one day. All right, bye, thank you.